Welcome, and thank you for joining us uh, this evening, this morning, um, to learn about a new research study that we're really excited about called Track FA. I am Jen Farmer. I'm the CEO at the Friedrichs Taxia Research Alliance, and Farah is uh, funding this research study. I'm joined by Professor Nelly Georgiou Karasansis from Monash University, who is the coordinating principal investigator of Track FA. And Nellie's going to um, kind of partner with me in sharing information through this webinar. And um, we'll go through a presentation that tells you about Track FA. And then at the end, we'll um, do questions and comments uh, from those listening this evening. Also joining us is Susan Walther, Farah's Director of Patient Engagement. Um, Susan's um, joining us as a moderator. She's um, gonna be in the background helping to monitor your questions and comments. We encourage you to use the Q&A box. So if you're not familiar with Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, if you put your cursor towards the bottom, you'll see a black bar that comes up and it'll say Q&A. And you can type your questions in at any point in time during the webinar. We encourage you to use that Q&A box instead of the chat box, because um, that'll help us keep track of the, the questions. And you'll also be able to see questions that are submitted by other people um, it, to see if the question you're interested in has already been asked. All right. So with that, I will get started. And, um, so why is Track FA important? and what led us to this research study. As many of you know, there are clinical trials currently under investigation, and we have um, over the years developed different clinical outcome measures that are helpful in um, helping us understand how the disease changes over time, things like the time 25 foot walk, the nine hole peg test, the Friedrich's ataxia rating scale. Um, those are all clinical outcome measures that we currently use in clinical trials. But, um, and as you know, those, um, when we use those scales, our trials have to run for at least 12 months or more. And our trials you know, need to have a lot of people in them to have sufficient power to measure change. And so one of the things we're continuing to work on is better ways to measure potential therapeutic impact in clinical trials. And biomarkers are one way to um, facilitate quicker trials. We believe that this is especially important for the next generation of trials that are going to come forward that are going to be gene therapy trials, because we also want to be able to measure not just um, if there's a clinical change, but we'd like to be able to know if the therapeutic intervention, the drug or the treatment is actually getting to specific target regions in the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and so biomarkers might be one way for us to study this. So what is a biomarker? Um, it's any characteristic that can reflect the progression um, or reflect a disease process. And typically biomarkers um, are very sensitive to change. Um, and one example of a biomarker that you might be familiar with is blood pressure or glucose in the context of diabetes. The glucose is a, is a biomarker that's used to measure response to treatment in diabetes. In Friedrich's ataxia, one example of a biomarker is for taxin protein levels. And we measure for taxin protein, um, but we can only measure it in accessible tissues like blood or cheek swabs or skin cells. We can't measure for taxin in the brain and spinal cord. And so one idea we have to since we can't measure for taxin in the brain and spinal cord is to find other biomarkers. And imaging specifically could provide us with a window into the brain and spinal cord um, so that we could understand quickly if treatments are reaching those target tissues and having a desired biological effect. 
there have already been some pilot studies of um, using different imaging modalities in FA. Um, these pilot studies have identified what we're calling biomarkers of interest. So for example, um, one research group has demonstrated that we can measure iron in the cerebellum of the brain, and you can see differences in individuals with FA compared to controls. Um, another group has looked at more structural images in the brain and the spinal cord. And what you're looking at here is a measure of spinal cord thickness. And what was observed is that um, the spinal cord is thinner in people with FA. And that again, that this, the thickness of the spinal cord changes over time. And so some of these um, pilot studies have given us ideas for where to look for neuroimaging biomarkers. However, um, some of these studies have some important limitations that have to be addressed before we can use these neuroimaging biomarkers in clinical trials. So for example, some of the studies were quite small um, in terms of sample size. Um, all of these have only been done at single sites. And as many of you know, clinical trials, you know, take place over many, need to take place over many trials and need to be global in FA. Uh, some of these studies were, you know, limited in terms of number of time points observed. And many of these occurred in adults with FA and um, some with more advanced disease. And so we don't have much data on people who are children or people um, who have just recently been diagnosed. And so to understand if this is gonna be a, a good, these are gonna be good biomarkers, we would like to be able to see a broad range and broad spectrum of disease progression. So what we need, um, and what we've identified as an opportunity is to put together a multi-site study looking at multiple neuroimaging um, tests over a broader range, range um, to see if these neuroimaging biomarkers can be used in future clinical trials. And that's really where TrackFA comes from. And we're really excited um, about the TrackFA study and the Neuroimaging Consortium. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Nellie so that she can tell you about um, this great group of people who are working together to do the study and to tell you more details about TrackFA itself. Nellie. Thanks so much, Jen. <clears throat> and it's a great pleasure um, to be joining you in this webinar. And thank you to everyone that's um, <clears throat> joined this evening, this morning, wherever you are across the globe. So as Jen said, we're very proud um, of the Track FA Neuroimaging Consortium. In fact, we started talking about um, the need for a study like Track FA a couple of years ago when a number of um, uh, academic partners uh, came together and started talking about what uh, we wanted to do in order to accelerate the progression and understanding of um, free drug ataxia. So the Track FA Neuroimaging Consortium consists of acad academic partners from six institutions across the globe, as you can see, Monash University and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute um, in Melbourne, Australia, um, Monash is also the overall um, coordinating um, site for the study um, we've, and also the coordinating site for the clinical and blood markers. We're very proud of our collaboration with the University of Minnesota, which uh, is the coordinating site for the uh, imaging, as well as our collaboration with the University of uh, Campinas uh, in Brazil, um, the uh, Aachen University in uh, German, Aachen in Germany, as well as the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Florida. So we're very excited uh, with our academic uh, partners, as you can see there, as well as uh, our collaboration uh, with industry, as well as with um, our adv advocacy group partners. So the purpose of the consortium is, is really to provide input uh, into the study design. It monitors progress um, just to ensure that the study is conducted uh, with the highest rigor. And we meet every month 
uh, to monitor progress. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to specifically talk to you about uh, the TRAC FA study in a little bit more detail. So as Jen mentioned, uh, the TRAC FA study is the largest multi-center longitudinal multimodal neuroimaging um, study uh, in the world. Uh, in Friedreich's ataxia. And I'll talk to you in a moment about what we mean by multimodal. But in essence, the study aims to recruit 200 adults and children with FA across the six different global sites, as you can see there, as well as 100 matched controls. There are three assessments. So taking part in the study uh, does uh, require a 24 month commitment uh, in the sense we uh, test at baseline, which is visit one. We then um, perform another assessment 12 months down the track at visit two, and then another assessment at 24 month follow up at visit three. And this is really important so we can understand how our different measurements change over this 24 month period, because we really want to understand uh, which are the best measures um, to demonstrate change of disease progression in free drug ataxia. Next slide, please. So there are a number of uh, overall study aims for track FA. The first of which is we want to be able to validate neuroimaging measurements in Friedreich ataxia. Uh, and it's really important to be able to validate imaging markers so that we're confident that that marker is actually sensitive in uh, tracking disease progression. Because at the end of the study, and the study is a five-year study, even though uh, we do require participation over 24 months, there's a lot of analyses and a lot of things that we need to do um, uh, with respect to um, delivering outcomes for the study. And that's why it's over a, a five-year period. But over that time, and at the end of that time, I should say, we want to be able to deliver a set of trial-ready biomarkers. So our industry partners can be confident that these measurements are going to be able to um, detect a change uh, in the efficacy of their drug in forestalling um, the disease progression. So that's really important to deliver a set of trial ready biomarkers at the end of the study. We want to also be able to improve the understanding of the natural history um, or the natural disease history of uh, Friedreich ataxia at multiple levels, at the spinal level, at the brain level, but also in conjunction with various other measurements uh, that I'll be talking to you about on the next slide. And we also aim to develop a comprehensive neuroimaging database in order to facilitate ongoing international research and discovery. And this is really critical. Um, so at the end of the study, we're going to have a very rich database that we can share with the research community who might want to um, ask different questions um, about disease progression. And so having access to this comprehensive neuroimaging database will facilitate and accelerate ongoing international research um, and discovery. And we see this in many other diseases such as Huntington's disease and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease where these large data sets are being um, made available and they're really accelerating our understanding uh, and research uh, discovery. So the long-term goal is to use the biomarkers that we determine are the most sensitive in clinical trials in order to accelerate the drug development effort. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk to you about now is what we mean by multimodal neuroimaging. So what we mean is when our participants, participants are in a scanner and having a scan, we can actually measure many different components of the brain and the spinal cord whilst the participant is in the scanner. And these different types of um, components measure different types of tissue properties in the brain. For example, we can look at brain or spinal cord structure. So we can look at how big or small a particular structure is in the brain. 
we can look at connectivity. What that means is we can look at the strength of the connection or the fibres, the fibre connection between different brain structures, and we can measure that as connectivity. We can look at iron levels in the brain to look at whether they're high or low in FA compared to our control participants. And the other thing we can do is look at different chemicals in the brain. So all of these uh, neuroimaging um, modalities give us a number of different measurements and they're the ones that we're interested in to see out of this suite of um, imaging, which measures are the most sensitive in tracking disease progression in FA. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about outcome measures. So as you've heard today, the primary focus of track FA is on the imaging. And so we can, um, focus on the imaging measures as our primary uh, outcome measures. However, we're also interested in what we call uh, or what we're calling secondary outcome measures and exploratory outcome measures. Our secondary outcome measures are clinical and cognitive tests and mood tests such as speech tests and other tests that you may have already participated in. And our exploratory measures are blood proteins. So the study will require taking a blood sample. Now, why is this important? This is important because we want to link the clinical, the cognitive and the blood measures to the brain and spinal cord measures that we will obtain from the imaging so that we can determine whether they're good markers of disease progression. So it's really important to understand the relationships between what's going on in the brain and the spinal cord with the clinical and the cognitive as well as the blood markers, because that will give us more information about understanding um, free drug ataxia in a more holistic way. Next slide, please. So who can participate in track FA? So individuals with free drug ataxia and um, volunteers without FA or controls who are aged five years of age and over. Now, you can still participate if you're enrolled in another study or another clinical trial, and that needs to be determined at your uh, local level. So if we look at the inclusions and the exclusions, um, so for free drug ataxia, the inclusions are you must have genetically confirmed free drug ataxia. Age of onset must be um, equal to or less than 25 years. Disease duration must be equal to or less than 25 years. And disease stage, we're primarily looking at earlier um, stages of free drug ataxia and primarily ambulatory participants because it's just easier to get in and out um, of, of the scanner. Now, the exclusions for both um, FA and control participants include metallic implants. So we can't test anyone, we can't scan anyone who has a metallic implant. Um, also, non-removable -remo metallic dental braces is another um, exclusion and any other medical condition that might interfere with your participation. And again, that will be determined uh, at the local level by your clinician. Next slide, please. So what to expect if you're taking part in, F, uh, in track FA? So as I mentioned, participation will involve three visits over two, two years, the baseline visit, 12 months thereafter, and then 24 months um, after that. Um, all associated costs are fully covered, meaning taxi, uh, meaning um, any accommodation or flights that, that you might require. Um, some sites are recruiting people from interstate or other locations. So all of those costs are absolutely fully, fully covered. In addition to that, you will receive a stipend um, for your participation at each visit. Now, each visit takes approximately uh, six hours, um, much less 
much less for controls um, and children who are 10 years and under. Uh, and the visit may be split over multiple days or it may be done on one day. And again, that's to be determined at the local level uh, by the study coordinators. So we will uh, require a medical history. So I'll be asking you questions about your medical history. Um, there will be a clinical um, assessment uh, that will be undertaken by the clinicians. Uh, there will be, <clears throat> excuse me, cognitive and mood assessments that will be, um, that will be uh, undertaken. There'll be a blood draw. Uh, and there will be uh, a scan. So the scan for um, the adults, uh, sorry, for those who are 11 years and older is around 1.5 um, hours, so one and a half hours, one hour and 15 minutes, somewhere there. And for children uh, 10 years and under, the scanning is much shorter, um, approximately 17 um, minutes. Next slide, please. So that brings me uh, to the end of uh, my presentation. And, and just finally, uh, if you are interested in participating in uh, Track FA and you'd like to register your interest, uh, we have all the details here for all the six different uh, academic sites. Uh, these uh, will be made available to you. The webinar will be made available to you. Uh, so you don't have to write all the details down now, um, but we do have um, contacts in all of our, um, at all of our sites. So we would love to uh, hear from you uh, and we look forward to your participation. So I'd like to thank you for um, the time you've taken to listen into this webinar. It's my great pleasure to be working with uh, Farah um, and all our industry partners, as well as uh, academic institutions uh, and we look forward to um, delivering um, the best outcomes for this study over the course of the next few years. Thank you, Jen. Over to you. Millie, thank you so much um, for sharing with us the details of the Track FA study. Um, and just to let folks know, um, we also have this study listed on the FARA website under um, clinical trials and all of the site coordinator contact information is there. Um, Track FA is also on the FA app. If you're using the FA app, you can uh, connect to one of the study coordinators directly through the app as well. Um, so I'm not sure if we have any questions yet. It doesn't look like it, um, but I had a few questions um, that I thought maybe um, Nelly, you might be able to address. <laughs> um, oh. One is related to, you know, a lot of people with FA have scoliosis and with the scoliosis, oftentimes there's um, surgery and rods are implanted. Do those rods that people get for scoliosis surgery exclude them from participating in track FA? Yes, thanks, Jen, for that question. Um, yes, it does exclude you from participating in track FA. Um, because the rods are in the spine, um, we can't actually undertake uh, the imaging. Um, so that is an exclusion when you're undertaking M MRI, um, you are not um, able to have any metallic um, uh, devices or instrumentation in the body uh, because it's very unsafe. Is it possible that some rods are MRI compatible? I've heard that before. Potentially, if so, that's something to be discussed at the local level um, with the study coordinator to determine whether the type of rod you have is safe. Um, and if it's deemed safe, then uh, that won't exclude your participation. But if it's deemed unsafe, then unfortunately uh, you will be excluded from the study. Um, Nellie, you also mentioned braces, which obviously lots of teenagers have braces as an exclusion. Um, there are also sometimes retainers, small yes. retainers that are left after braces. Are those also exclusion? No, they're not exclusion. So retainers are not exclusions. Um, so that, that's absolutely fine. Okay, thank you. Um, um, if we can, there's a comment that came in regarding the the rods with scoliosis, that since um, the year 2000, it's suggested that all rods were made compatible with MRI. So it definitely is worth a conversation. Yes. With the study coordinator. Good. Thank you so much. 
Yes, thank you, Chandra, uh, for posting that uh, chat. Yes, absolutely. Please do discuss that with, with the, the study coordinator just to determine the safety. Thank you. Um, Nellie, another question about, you know, um, with research studies, we keep people's um, data that we collect and their information confidential that, you know, that's incredibly important um, as researchers and to protect people's um, privacy. How do you do that when you're collecting these um, detailed MRIs of the, of the, of the head specifically, like on some of those images you showed, like you can see profiles and whatnot. Yes, yes. Look, thanks, Jen. That's a very good question. Um, so uh, to answer that, I will say that every study site, so all of the six academic sites um, have put forward um, an ethics um, proposal for the study and the study has been cleared by ethics, which means that um, we can undertake uh, the study, which has um, been overseen by a, a, an ethics governing body. So when we conduct studies like this, um, we need to ensure that uh, we do not identify any individual in any way. So every individual who participates in this study will be um, assigned a ID number, a unique ID number, which does not uh, list their name or any other detail. So we can't identify them. So that's the first thing. The second thing to mention is when we are scanning, you, you're, you're right, uh, Jen, that sometimes you can you can see the sort of the, the face uh, or the profile of the individual, but we have very fancy imaging um, uh, techniques, which allows us to deface or block out the actual profile or face of the subject. Uh, and that's exactly what we will do. So in no way will any individual be identified either through the imaging uh, or through participation because uh, we have unique identifiers uh, as well as the defacing of the imaging. Thanks, Nelly. I think that um, ability to do that defacing is really quite remarkable um, yes, and hopefully gives indeed. people some confidence. Um, it looks like we have a question. Uh, Carl Sorensen is asking, um, we have a daughter, 34 years old, uh, who's in a wheelchair. Are, are we including any uh, FAers in wheelchairs in the study who use wheelchair? Um, so, Jen, you might want to remind me of, of, of this. I, we, I think we yeah, so it's, it's not an exclusion. Um, no. we, we are including people in the study who are non-ambulatory, um, but we are, you know, there are a limited number of spots um, for people at various ages, as well as at all the stages um, kind of of FA so that we ensure that we don't get you know, too many people at any one age or stage of FA. Um, and so it'll depend on your study location and, you know, how many of those individuals who might have already been enrolled um, to see if those spots are still available. Yes. And the question is, has uh, MRI brain studies, oh, I think the question might be oh, asking if, if have there been. have been. Uh, yes. So there, there have been studies done at Monash previously in FA, lots of them, um, and you may have been able to participate in them in the past. And if you have, you can come back and hopefully participate in this study as well. I had a question about the time in the MRI scanning you had mentioned for Older, people older than 10, it could be up to one and a half hours. Um, yes. I have had somebody, potential participant ask if there's the ability to listen to music or, or anything that can kind of take up the time when they're doing that MRI. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can listen to music. Uh, so whilst you're in the MRI, you, you are given a headset. Um, and so that headset 
um, will provide music and, and some locations might also be able to play videos for young children. Um, so again, that, that will be determined, uh, you know, at your local site. Um, and also we can break up, we can break up the uh, session if people need to go to the bathroom, um, that's fine. And the one hour and 15, one hour and a half includes getting on the table, getting off the table, the whole setup as well. Um, but yes, you can listen to music. So it looks like I opened up a little bit of a can of worms with my question about the <laughs> scoliosis <laughs> surgery and the spinal cord rod. Yes, but, yes, um, yes. Our, our project manager, um, Karen, um, has messaged all of us and just said that, you know, in general, across the board, the consortium had decided to um, exclude all types of rods, even those that are MRI compatible, because they do mm -hmm. still interfere with the quality of the image that can be obtained. And so Karen, thank you for setting us straight on that. I really appreciate it. Um, I just know it's a, it's a question that always comes up anytime there's an MRI study. Yes. Um, one of the other questions that folks might have that maybe I can address is related to one another one of the inclusion criteria, which is um, confirmation of genetic diagnosis of FA. Um, so if you have a confirmed diagnosis of FA, but you can't find the genetic test report, or if the genetic test report is from a long time ago and um, it doesn't have GA repeat lengths reported, or um, you haven't been able to get genetic testing yet um, for FA, but would like to participate, um, we do provide testing as part of the screening process and we can send um, a sample, we can take care of genetic testing as part of pre-screening you for, for the study. Mm. And an, I guess another question, and we touched on it before, is um, if you're involved in other studies or clinical trials, um, whether you can take part in Track FA. Um, and I think on one of the slides, I, I mentioned that, um, that uh, yes, you can, but it's best always to check um, at the local level with the study, uh, study coordinator um, who can provide more, more detail. We've run out of questions there, Jen. I think so. That's what I was just looking at, making sure that I didn't miss any. Susan, do you have anything else? I didn't. I just was thinking about um, the time frame and what had been said about biomarkers in the very beginning. And if you're following patients over two year time and want mm -hmm. to use biomarkers for clinical trials, is there hope that there's going to be changes that are found in a shorter amount of time than two years? Mm -hmm. um, mm. Okay, so, so that's a, a really good question. Um, we based the uh, design on the pilot studies and the, the number of studies that, that have um, already been published. Well, we don't have any evidence uh, at this stage that biomarkers, for example, in free drugs can change or imaging biomarkers can change, let's say over six months. We, we just, we, we don't know. Um, but we are more confident that we'll see a change over a 12 month, 24 month period. Um, so it, it's a really, really good question. And in fact, Jen, if you recall, we were debating this uh, when we actually um, started thinking about the design of the study, whether we would do a, a sort of six month um, uh, assessment. Um, and, and you're quite right, with clinical trials, we wanna see a change quickly, um, not over a longer period of time. However, we, we are confident that over the 24 months, we will see change. Mm -hmm. um, and we've based the, um, the period of testing, 12 months and then 24 months, we based that on the studies that were already published. Uh, so that was the, the, uh, the best we could do. Um, is going on what was published. But we there could also, be changes earlier. 
Yeah, we also know that for the clinical measures that we're trying to compare the imaging to, we have to allow at least 12 months or longer to see change. And if we want to correlate some of those clinical changes to what we're seeing in the imaging, um, that was another part of the rationale for the, the length of the study. But the hope is that, you know, if we could, if, if we had a treatment and we could have a, a treatment arm as well, that maybe we would see the changes with treatment, you know, a response to treatment more quickly, but, you know, we're just, we're not there yet. So. Let's, let me just see. There's a there's a question there. Um, let's see. Um, if spinal rods are excluded, is there a concern for translate? So being able to translate to the clinic as a future biomarker, since many FA patients do have rods. So I guess extrapolating the data and being applicable to people who have had scoliosis surgery. Yeah. Um, look, that, that, that's a, a good question. Um, very good, good question. Um, so, look, we, we primarily, as Jen mentioned, we're looking at primarily earlier disease onset um, because that's where we hope to potentially look at targeting treatment. But, but that's not to say um, that, uh, you know, we won't be able to, um, what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that you're right, but, you know, we just have to wait and see um, what we find. We're, we're hoping that it will be translatable to those that have um, rods and that's all we can, all we can do. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is a follow-up that can be done um, after yeah. this study is we, once we know exactly what modalities, again, when we talked earlier, Nelly talked about multiple modalities that were being assessed with this study, both in the brain and the spinal cord. At the end of the study, once we've narrowed down the modalities that are gonna be most sensitive to change, it's possible that some of those modalities will be less impacted, right, by that hardware. Um, and the, you know, we can still obtain an adequate a uh, detailed scan in people who've had rods placed. And that's, that's a quick follow-up that could be done where you know, we'd be able to compare some people with rods to the data we have in Track FA and say, were we able to get an adequate picture of this brain region or this spinal cord region and measure what needs to be measured? Um, that, that is something we can do pretty, pretty quickly, I think, and easily at the end. Um, yeah. Once the, the we other know what the precise measures are that that we want to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the other thing that um, and some of the research that we've done at, at Monash, we've shown that um, different structures can can change um, depending on um, the age at onset, disease severity, uh, and that's a really important thing to also be able to to understand um, when it comes to clinical trials and targeting different different brain regions um, is to understand the different stages that, that people are at, which can offer really important clues as we go forward with drug discovery. And we have a question from Amalia. Uh, will there be a defined number of participants set for each center or is it a first come first serve basis? I know you talked about the 200 FAers that you're targeting. Yeah. But are you um, setting a limit of how many participants can be at each center? Yeah, look, each, each center has put forward an estimated number of participants that uh, they think they can, they can test. Um, so, um, how, so, so we're going to be guided by those estimates. Um, First in, first serve, I think that we're pretty flexible. Um, if you're interested in participating in the study, you meet the, um, the inclusion uh, criteria, I guess we'd be very happy to, to test you um, and for you to take part in the study. We will be monitoring as we go on, and obviously there are COVID-related issues at each different site. We'll be monitoring um, the enrolment uh, at each site as we move forward. Uh, and once we reach our number, 
uh, down the track, then we might have to, to cap that. But at this stage, um, I would say if you're interested in participating and you can meet the inclusion criteria, please come forward. Thank you. All right. I think that might be um, all the questions we've gotten. And um, I just want to thank you, Nelly, for joining us today to tell us about the Track FA study. And thank you for all of your work in leading the Track FA study and consortium and um, helping us um, get to this exciting point. Um, the study has been open now for several months. People have already um, signed up and are enrolling. Um, but 200 is a big number. It's really mm -hmm. ambitious. Um, we really do need um, everyone in the FA community to come out and, and participate if you're able to, um, especially if you're close to one of our uh, clinical sites. We hope that that you'll consider participating in the study. If you have additional questions that you think of after this, um, or if you weren't able to join us uh, live and you're watching the recording and you have questions, please certainly feel free to reach out uh, to myself or to any of the study coordinators um, or to Susan, you know, where if we don't know the answer, we'll, we'll reach out to the study team and get it for you. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you to all of our um, partners in the Track FA study, all of the academic sites. It's a team of people that's been really dedicated to this, the investigators, the coordinators, um, and to our other um, industry partners who have helped us um, really make this study go. It's, it's a huge effort and we're really excited about it. So thank you all so much and um, take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Bye.